Thank you. Good morning. I'm delighted once again to be with you folks. For those I haven't met before, my name is Tom Hoyle with Bible and Science Ministries. And since 1985, our full-time work has dealt with the wonderful accuracy of God's Word, especially in terms of history and archaeology and science. We believe, as I know your pastor does, that the deeper we dig, the better God's Word looks. And so during the week, we speak in public schools, Christian schools, homeschool groups, Awanas, youth rallies, and that kind of thing. And of course, on Sundays, we get to be in God's houses like yours, and we can't thank you enough for your interest and friendship and support. Yes, we have not been very happy with COVID this year. It has uh, dinged our ministry somewhat, but we're really, really looking forward to maybe by next spring, after the vaccine comes out, being fully back in a saddle again. But uh, at any rate, great to be here again, and on top of that, instead of driving three hours or taking a plane, a plane ticket, ticket, folks, I'm 30 minutes away, so this is sweet, okay? Well, before we begin, we've been asked many uh, questions about the resources. I don't like doing commercials, but we do want people to get the right thing for the right reason, otherwise there could be some disappointment. Regarding the materials, I do bring them because number one, many of them are hard to get. Some are out of print. And number two, we do discount them, sometimes quite dramatically. As far as the DVDs are concerned, the Design of Life three-part series is terrific for the entire family, giving all kinds of examples of divine design requiring a divine designer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you have heard about the Intelligent Design uh, series of DVDs. Latest one, absolutely amazing. I love this DVD. The Call of the Cosmos is the successor of the famous DVD, The Privileged Planet but this covers the whole universe. Gorgeous. And then one more, this is the latest top creation DVD. It's just come out, it's called Dismantled. This is my preference for witnessing purposes. It's got gorgeous music, great graphics, tons of good information demonstra demonstrating that true science agrees with the Bible. It's not science versus the Bible, is it? It might be science versus evolution, it might be the Bible versus evolution, but as you might know, true science always agrees with God's word, doesn't it? As far as the books are concerned, Made in Heaven is my favorite book regarding divine design, dozens of examples in nature of things that could not possibly have evolved. However, this book came to America last year from England, where it became a bestseller, and they translated the British English into American English, and so we now have Wonders of Creation. This is my favorite family book on the Bible and science. On top of that, it's full of divine design examples, and it has a whole section on creation astronomy. This is a superb book, and many of you have got the companion volume called Evidence for the Bible. And then one last item, time to think big, folks, really big. I thought this was a kiddie book. I was wrong. This is a terrific family-level book on wildlife. It's the finest I've ever seen, the most gorgeous and accurate and scriptural. God's big book of animals is not just for little kids. It is for everybody. I buy these in huge quantities, which means we can make them available at very, very good discounts. And then I was mistaken, last book. For those of you who want meat and potatoes for teenagers and adults, Evolution's Achilles Heels is my personal recommendation. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I'm all choked up. If I were in a college, we'd be a lot more technical than we are today, but here in church, we're going to be more family friendly. All right? If you have a technical question, I would be happy to talk with you uh, afterwards. But it's time to get started. All right? So, can we go ahead and have the lights, please? Thank you so much for being here today. We do hope you had a good Christmas. Yeah, go ahead, turn off the lights, please. Uh, it's easier to see the slides and you don't need to be seeing me. Is that okay? We're working on it. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started while we're working on it. All right, as you might know, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In this program, which is one of 35 programs we share in churches and schools, let's look at 
fascinating examples of divine design requiring a divine designer in 10 different categories. Let's get started with engineering in divine design. And we begin by looking up, way up, at something armed and dangerous, the saguaro cactus of the southwestern United States. How many have been to Arizona, for example, and seen these wonderful plants? Aren't they great? They can be 50 feet uh, tall. That's five stories tall. They can have up to 50 arms, and they can, well, hold 200 gallons of water. How on earth do they do that? Well, the saguaro cactus, it's not a tree. It's a plant, but it's a plant with a skeleton. It's a skeleton made up of up to 32 two-inch diameter ribs. This wonderful design enables this plant to stand tall and straight. For my evolutionary friends, and we might have some here today, we're honored you're with us. We hope you'll keep an open mind. My evolutionary friends do not know what this plant evolved from. It's extremely unique, folks, and very, very well designed. Literally, if you will, pointed evidence for creation by God. So much more could be said, but we have a lot more to share. We turn from botany and engineering to zoology, in particular entomology, and in particular beetles, specifically the firefly, AKA the lightning bug. I do live in Tacoma. Uh, we have been in all 50 states and five foreign countries, but I do miss when I'm, for example, in the Midwest, I do miss in uh, thinking about back home, the lack of fireflies we have here. We don't have them, do we? I grew up as a kid in Michigan collecting fireflies, which was great until I finally realized I needed to punch holes in the lid. <laughs> My evolutionary friends have a terrible time explaining the divine design of the bioluminescence in fireflies, and they do not know what it could possibly have evolved from. As you might recall, man spent a great deal of time trying to create artificial light, especially cold chemical light in the form of glow sticks. We did not perfect this until 1980. Guess what? We are told, folks, that the biochemical formula of the bioluminescence of the firefly it is brighter, longer lasting, and more flexible than man has been able to engineer. If we can't duplicate it, folks, I don't think it evolved by accident, did it? But it gets better. We are told by biologists over 200 types of bioluminescence are in nature. Many of them have different formulas, which means, folks, they have to explain the bioluminescence evolution of these creatures not just once, but almost 200 separate individual parallel times. I don't think that happened over and over again, do you? One miracle is bad enough to explain. Incidentally, before we move on, we do want to share some devotional thoughts with you along the way. Regarding light, the Bible tells us, as you probably already know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. However, for the sake of time, let's move on to mechanics in divine design, starring our favorite subject, us. <laughs> In a different program, we talk about the miracle of man, how the human body has 12 bioelectrical chemical systems. How many of these systems has man been able to duplicate artificially from scratch in the laboratory? Anybody? You're very negative, but you're right. <laughs> Zero. Zip, zilch, nada. Folks, once again, if we can't duplicate any of these systems on purpose, like our circulatory system or nervous system, do you think any of these systems evolved by accident? That's most illogical, don't you think? For right now, for the sake of time, let's look at a couple of my favorite examples. For starters, in our skeletal muscular system, the human hand, a marvel of engineering design. 27 bones, 35 muscles, as well as, as you know, skin and ligaments and tendons, arteries, veins, and capillaries, capable of 58 different motions. I was at a bionics conference in Columbus, Ohio one time. I was told this is the latest, greatest artificial human hand. Do you think we've got a ways to go yet, folks? 
before we catch up with the original equipment? Or let's go to the heart of the matter, literally. We are told that a six foot tall man in a lifetime, his heart is gonna beat three and a half billion times. Each day, his heart will pump the equivalent of 40, 55 gallon drums of blood. My goodness, folks, this downright tuckers me out thinking about it. Mechanical engineers have told me man has not built a pump that can pump as hard, as often, as long, as much as a human heart. No wonder we've been unable to create an artificial heart as, as good as the original equipment. By the way, at that Columbus exhibit, I was told this is the latest, greatest artificial heart, folks. <laughs> it takes up a good deal of your torso. You look at science fiction, and we hear and read about bionic people, robots, androids, cyborgs, the former governor of California. But folks, this is all make-believe. It's all science fiction. We are just way too complicated, folks. Maybe someday, perhaps in many more decades, we will be able to engineer an artificial human in the laboratory from scratch. What will that prove? Great intelligence is responsible for the origin of the human body. <laughs> and the Bible has been telling us that all along. Of course, regarding scripture, the first one that comes to my mind anyway is, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Although I do a lot of homeschool support group programs, and one mom told me her kids were just fearfully made. Literally, moving on, we now to turn to transportation in divine design. Wow. We are told dolphins can swim up to 70 miles per hour. The Navy tells me they do not have a submersible that can go that fast. Or God's most dishonest creature, the cheetah. Some of you got that. We have an entire program of miraculous animal, animals, and the cheetah would be one of them, but... As you can see, we are told, folks, a cheetah can reach a velocity of 78 miles per hour in 10 seconds flat. But most people would agree the most wonderful example of transportation in nature would be flight. As you know, man has spent a great deal of time learning how to fly. Nature has been doing it far, far better, far, far longer, and it didn't just happen. But guess what? My evolutionary friends have to explain the miracle of flight not just once, but four separate individual parallel times. For example, insects. And then we have mammals that fly, right? Like the bats. But they fly completely differently than the insect. And then we've had reptiles flying, right? Like the pterosaurs. But once again, they fly very differently. And then, that's right, the champions of flight flying very, very differently, birds. And we talk a lot more about that in a different program. For that, right now, folks, may we make mention of the bald eagle. Wow. The bald eagle, as you might already know, he spends hours, sometimes at an altitude of 10,000 feet. He can see a rabbit two miles away. He can do a power dive of 200 miles per hour. He can do much more than that. And yet, folks, a bald eagle only weighs 8 to 12 pounds. He's a marvel of aeronautical engineering. So much more could be said about the bald eagle and his aerodynamics. But we're reminded, folks, of that famous scripture. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not be faint. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, in my ministry, I've been to uh, about a couple dozen zoos, uh, about 25 science centers, and 32 natural history museums, and I was very surprised at this Cincinnati Zoo. They had an exhibit on the design of flight. See, design is ordinarily a bad word to use in evolutionary circles because design requires a designer, right? Well, that exhibit, folks, talked about the miracle of flight 
And speaking of eagles, I'm reminded of the Air Force's F-15 fighter plane, the Eagle. I served in the Air Force Reserve for uh, 35 years, and uh, twice I had uh, F-15 squadrons to uh, minister to. Folks, the F-15 Eagle is the most successful fighter plane in history. It has been 106 aerial battles or dogfights. It has never been shot down once in air-to-air -air combat. If I told you the F-15 designed itself and built itself, you'd say it was mad. Folks, ounce for ounce, God's bald eagle, ounce for ounce, is more sophisticated than any F-15 eagle. If somebody designed and made the F-15, somebody designed and made the bald eagle. It's only logical, folks. Well, hey, while all this transportation going on, navigation starts looking like a good idea, doesn't it? Man has marveled over the navigational capabilities of various aerial and marine creatures. In particular, people are in awe over the homing pigeon, and rightly so. The homing pigeon, folks, very popular in England. And for one thing, the homing pigeon has INS. That's not Immigration and Naturalization Service. It's Inertial Navigational System. I understand from the experts, from ornithologists, that if you take a homing pigeon up to 2,300 miles away and release him, he can fly back home. But it gets better. I am told if you put a hood on a homing pigeon, release him, and he can still fly back home. How on earth is that? Well, folks, the homing pigeon follows his nose. At the base of his beak, he has a magnetic deposit. It's a compass built inside his body. Who put the compass there, folks? How does he know what to do with it? What happens, we're told, is the homing pigeon, when it's taken someplace, his brain records a magnetic field of the earth. It determines its strength. When released, his brain replays that memory, and he follows his nose back home. I'm reminded, folks, of, in this case here, the USS New Jersey launching a Tomahawk cruise missile. Cruise missiles are amazing, aren't they? But ounce for ounce, folks, a homing pigeon is more sophisticated than a cruise missile. <laughs> homing pigeons did not evolve from some dinosaur, folks. So much more could be said about homing pigeons in particular and the amazing navigational capabilities of various creatures. Spiritually speaking, though, we note, the Lord God shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. Well, when it comes to navigation, sensors sometimes can be very useful, correct? With regard to bats, they have a, a bit of an advantage in some ways over us. They have aerial echolocation capability, don't they? Now, it's not radar. That's a common misconception, right? It's aerial sonar, not radar. A lot could be said about bats, an entire program, actually. By the way, I know you ladies probably don't like bats, but you should. Do you know the North American brown bat at night, in total darkness, in flight, eats a mosquito every 10 seconds? There's a colony in Texas, we're told, that polishes off one ton of mosquitoes per year. Let's give it up for the North American brown bat, folks, okay? I better not chase a rabbit here, but do you know each bat has its own unique frequency? The list goes on and on about these remarkable creatures. When I was stationed in the Air Force Reserve at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base outside Dayton, Ohio, I learned from the research and development people, the Air Force is actively researching bat technology to get ideas, folks. They're hoping to catch up with the bat. No, folks, I don't think that these aerial furry creatures evolved by chance. But. Hey, since we're in the great northwest here, in the Puget Sound area in particular, we turn to marine echolocation, sonar. And the Navy tells me they are still actively researching the sonar capabilities of dolphins. Indeed, how many have been to the wonderful museum in Keyport, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center? Oh, folks, you've got to go there. It's so close. 
but don't go on Monday. It's a very bad day. It's closed, okay? It's free. And they told me all about dolphin technology and how sophisticated it is. I talked to one of their researchers in particular. The Navy's trying to catch up, folks, with the dolphin. Or since we're underwater, let's continue to see how in a good way that creation's all wet, we turn from echolocation to electromagnetic sensors, as in the case of the narwhal. Talk about a whale of a tail, or a tail of a whale. The narwhal can be 15 feet long with an eight foot long tusk, a probe. For centuries, people tried to figure out what on earth is that thing for? They thought it was used as an underwater sword fighting tool. Well, in the last decade, they discovered something, folks. That is an electromagnetic wand. It has an extensive array of electromagnetic sensors. It reminds us of the magnetic anomaly detector boom on the Navy's P-3 Orion Patrol uh, aircraft. Perhaps you've seen these flying over the area here. They're out of Whidbey, up north. Folks, my evolutionary friends still don't know how the narwhal evolved that probe. They don't know what creature he evolved from to get the probe, and they don't know for sure how the electromagnetic sensors work. I don't think that that marine cetaceous mammal could possibly have evolved. Or, speaking of which, we turn to one of my favorite creatures, the duck platypus. Part beaver, part duck, part otter, part dolphin, part turtle, part rooster. What did he evolve from? No one has a clue. I better not chase a rabbit here, but in short, folks, he's a monotreme. In nature, we've got placental mammals, which include us. We've got marsupial mammals, which include kangaroos. And all by themselves, in their own little category, are two creatures, the monotremes, the duckbill platypus and the spiny anteater, the echidna. Personally, I think the duckbill platypus is either God's idea of a practical joke or God assembled him from leftover parts. But for now, folks, we note nobody understands the electromagnetic sensors in his beak, and they do not know what any of them evolved from. Well, you and I, we're more accustomed to our five senses, and they are astonishing, especially the gift of sight. I must tell you, sometimes... Um, I put off going to the dentist. I never put off seeing my eye doctor. I want to make sure my eyes are in tip-top condition, folks. Well, our eyes are one of the ultimate wonders, a miracle, a divine design, folks, composed of over 50 different components. Now, here's the rub. All 50 components have to be there for the eye to work. They all have to be there at the same time, fully formed, working together. This is an incredible example of what they call irreducible complexity. And it's a huge problem for evolution to explain. But it gets even better. We not only have these amazing eyes, but highly specialized versions of them. No wonder Charles Darwin said every time he looked at an eye, it made him cold all over. He also said to suppose that the eye, with all of its contrivances, could have been formed through natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd to the highest degree. And we'd have to agree. But let's get more specific, folks. We consider honeybees. They can see ultraviolet light. We can't, they can, comes in handy for them because they use this to zero in on the petals of the flowers that they need to cross-pollinate. How did that happen by chance, folks? Evolution has to explain how the flowers and the honeybees evolved together at the same time working together. Not going to happen. Or we turn from ultraviolet vision to low light vision capability. In the Air Force Reserve, I had to get checked out on night vision goggles. And folks, you should feel some compassion for our folks that have to use night vision goggles. The resolution is terrible. And the, the um, uh, uh, I'll get this straight here. Uh, your depth perception is almost non-existent. 
And the depth of field is very, very narrow. That's why if you see somebody wearing night vision goggles, you notice they're constantly panning their head back and forth. That's because the field of view is so narrow. And let me tell you, your neck gets sore after a while doing that. Man has not perfected any kind of night vision as good as that what we find in nature. Now having said that, it is with a very heavy heart that I tell you, the finest night vision on the planet Earth, folks, it's not belonging to owls, it belongs to the cat. That's right. How many here are cat people? How many here are dog people? Oh, now, wait a minute. Some of you raised your hands twice. You can't do that. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Okay? <laughs> well, back to our subject, folks. We talk more about our amazing five senses, our inability to duplicate them in the laboratory from scratch. Spiritually speaking, though, we note, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, with all these wonderful sensors in nature, camouflage starts sounding like a really good idea for survival. I can tell you after 35 years in the Air Force Reserve, the military has worked very hard on camouflage. They are forever changing their camouflage patterns. Nature has been doing it far, far better, far, far longer, and it didn't just happen. For example, here I'm holding a stick bug. How did it know to look like that? By the way, may I ask how many have been to the Victoria Bug Zoo in Victoria, BC? Anybody? I highly, highly recommend. Oh, you've been there, sir. Is that awesome or what? It's walking distance from the ferry. It's extremely inexpensive. And folks, they have all sorts of terrariums full of fascinating examples of insects that defy evolutionary origin, including this stick bug. Or ladies, that's a bug. I held an orchid mantis in my hand. The orchid mantis looks exactly like an orchid blossom in every way. It can even change its color to match the other orchid blossoms. How did it know to look like this? So ladies, if you're ever given an orchid, take a long look at it first before you sniff it. The seaweed seahorse, that's a fish. It looks absolutely like marine foliage, doesn't it? And there are many, many fascinating amphibians and reptiles with intriguing camouflage. But of all the examples possible, folks, here's my favorite. Uh, in my ministry, I'm constantly reading textbooks. I just finished reading 13 astronomy textbooks because of our astronomy series. But in this case, folks, I read the main textbook on herpetology, the study of amphibians and reptiles. As far as I know, in that one-inch thick book, they only used a, question, a exclamation mark once, and it was in conjunction with the South American false side bottom frog. What about him? Well, he's a tiny little frog, pretty helpless. When he's being pursued by a predator, he hops like crazy until he comes to soft ground, to mud. He quickly digs a little hole. He sticks his head in the hole. He raises his backside up into the air. He curls his hind legs in back of him, which have fake fangs on them. He then inflates an airbag in each rump. Each rump swells to three times its normal size. A big black eye appears on each rump. What on earth is he doing? Well, he's mooning his attacker. His attacker thinks a horrible bug-eyed monster is coming out of the muck when in actuality the attacker has simply gotten to the bottom of things. Folks, how did this frog know to evolve these really weird features? From what creature did he evolve these features? And here's the kicker, folks. How does he know he looks like that back there? How does he know what to do? In a very interesting study, they hatched eggs of these frogs in isolation from each other. When danger came, when they were fully formed, without ever having seen a fellow frog, each frog knew what to do. Each frog had a pre-programmed created instinct, a very, very bizarre one. We could go on and on, but I have a spiritual question for you. Does God want his people to be spiritually camouflaged on this earth? How many say yes? How many say no? 
How many don't know or don't care? <laughs> Folks, as you probably already know, the Bible wants us to be ambassadors, right? We're supposed to let our light shine before men. God does not need any secret agents, does he? He doesn't want any uh, uh, commandos, all right? He wants us to stand tall and true for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We now come to my favorite category, architecture and construction in divine design. Man has marveled over all the examples of ingenious architecture in nature. In fact, some of these examples indicate that the instinct of these creatures is more amazing than the creature itself. There are many examples possible. For example, we talk about spider webs in a different program. They are astonishing. But right now, I'm very grateful to the Lord. Um, each time I'm in Denver, Colorado, I like to, if I can, visit their Natural History Museum. It's one of my personal favorites. And on one occasion, I was thrilled to see they had a temporary exhibit on animal engineering, especially featuring bird nests. They had example after example of fascinating design, folks, of refined feathered friends. Many examples we could talk about now. They'll have to wait for later. I gave you one of my favorites, though. May we say a quick word about the Taylor bird? The Taylor bird is a cute little bird, and when the male decides it's time to settle down, he will build a nest to attract his mate. The Taylor bird knows from pre-programmed created instinct to go out and find specific leaves, and using his beak as a pair of scissors, he will cut the leaves into pre-patterned uh, pre shapes, okay? He will bring them back to his building site. Then he makes his own thread, and the ladies tell me he uses a French stitch to sew the various shapes of leaves together. Who taught this bird how to sew? How does he know what to do, folks? But you know what's even more amazing than all the wonderful examples of physical architecture in nature? It's spiritual architecture, isn't it? Spiritual architecture of us. God's word tells us, he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Next, information technology. Time for some IT folks in divine design starring the human brain. Wow. We are told that the human brain is the most sophisticated three pound bit of matter in the universe. Dr. Isaac Asimov is my favorite science fiction author. He actually wrote uh, 400 books during his lifetime. A hundred of them are nonfiction textbooks. At any rate, even he admitted he did not know how the human brain could possibly have evolved, especially the miracle of instinct. Instinct to our brain, it's a lot like software to a computer. Well, computers don't design or make themselves, do they? And software doesn't design or make itself either. Again, even my evolutionary friends are in awe over the complexity of this pre-programmed created instinct in nature. And we've already seen some examples, haven't we? But the two most famous examples of instinct would have to be, that's right, survival and reproduction. I can think of few creatures more amazing for those two things than the emperor penguin. Wow. The emperor penguin, he can survive temperatures of 70 degrees below zero. He can survive winds of 140 miles per hour. His feet don't freeze off because he has a very unique heat exchange and his circulatory system of his feet. We could go on and on. The emperor penguin can dive, dive, dive 1,400 feet straight down in Arctic water. The Navy tells me that their latest uh, Virginia-class submarine is not supposed to go that deep. We could go on and on and on. How many here have seen, for example, March of the Penguins? Some of you? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It is very inspiring. It practically cries out creation. It's extremely interesting and downright funny in places, folks. And it goes on about the amazing migrational capabilities of these birds. For my evolutionary friends, the penguin is a disaster. 
they don't know how he evolved all of his abilities, his instincts, his capabilities. They don't know how he evolved personally. I was impressed. I was at a, a particular zoo one time. It might have been the Portland Zoo. They actually admitted in this exhibit here, they did not know what creature the penguin could possibly have evolved from. But they indicated the number one option would have been from an albatross-like ancestor. Whoa, 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 hold the phone. Stop. Let's wait, folks, here for a minute, please. Really? Really? The number one thing they said that tells them that penguins and albatrosses had similar ancestry, it would be because both have similar nostrils. Hello. You know, folks, over the years, I've met many of my evolutionary friends who were doctors, um, who are engineers, scientists, teachers, professors, technicians, engineers, all right? The ones I meet who know the most about evolution frequently have the biggest doubts about it, and you can see why. Look at penguins. Consider albatrosses. Folks, albatrosses can fly for, in, for hour on hour at high altitude, right? They have air-filled, paper-thin, lightweight bones. Penguins have Rock hard, heavy, solid, dense, flat bones. Why? If you're diving 1,400 feet straight down, do you want air filled bones? No, that's right. Folks, penguins have their legs mounted at the end of their bodies. Albatrosses, like most birds, have their legs mounted at the center of their bodies, correct? The list goes on and on. Albatrosses can fly, penguins can't. I don't think the two have a common ancestry. I believe each were created and only reproduced after their own kind. Well, before we move on from penguins, we note that regarding penguins, that they have a, an amazing ability to survive and thrive, and we can too, right? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, correct? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, last, not least, I hope I wasn't going too fast, but I was told that uh, they turn off the microphone at, at 11 o'clock. So again, I hope I wasn't going too rapidly, but we wanted to get done in time. We're almost done. We now come to our last category, symmetry in divine design. And some of you are thinking, wow, good, let my people go. <laughs> in nature, we find so many examples, folks, of symmetry, of geometry, that cry out divine design. May I share with you a few of my personal favorites, starting with gastropods, i.e. seashells. Wow. We are told, folks, these evolved by accident. I'm more inclined to think that these are works of art. Do you think works of art like these just evolved by accident or chance? I don't think so. But here's the ultimate example. The Nautilus. The Nautilus is actually a cephalopod. And here, of course, as you can see, we have a cross-section of a Nautilus shell. The Nautilus, on average, folks, can be up to 12 inches across and have up to 32 ballast tanks concentrically arranged around a central core. He uses those so that he can go up and down in the water. And folks, by the way, the Navy tells me they could not have a submarine be motionless in the water until the advent of computer technology. The Nautilus has been doing it all along. Here we have a geometric depiction of the geometry of a Nautilus shell. This is drawn by a kindergartner during recess with a crayon. How many believe me? How many think I'm full of hooey? How many think somebody awfully smart put this chart together? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Folks, if it's obvious that somebody with great intelligence created this chart, how much more obvious is it that somebody even smarter created the original upon which the chart is based? But next, and I admit, I did not think about this until a few years ago, we find symmetry in nature, not just in terms of the visual, but the audio. Case in point, bird song. Ornithologists tell us that there are approximately 103 different kinds of bird song in nature. And in some cases, these birds, even when they've been hatched 
after being isolated during their incubation period, they hatch and they already know their pre-programmed tunes. <laughs> Somebody gave them the instinct to sing, folks, and how to sing. How did that happen by accident or chance? I don't think so. Last, not least, ladies, I can see why you in particular like flowers. They are gorgeous, aren't they? I'm grateful my wife loves uh, growing flowers so I can enjoy them. But you know what? For my evolutionary friends, something they don't teach in most schools, the evolutionary origin of flowering plants is a huge challenge. In fact, botany in general is a big problem for evolution. But not even on top of that, when I look at flowers, I frequently think about the miracle of symbiosis. Once again, folks, how did these flowers evolve everything necessary for bees, bats, birds, and butterflies to cross-pollinate them? How did the bees, bats, birds, and butterflies evolve their various features and the instinct to cross-pollinate these flowers? The problems facing the theory of evolution regarding symbiosis, they wind up multiplying. Well, as you can imagine, we could go on and on and on, but regarding flowers, the, the Bible tells us, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I would be delighted to speak with you afterwards if you have any questions or comments, and as the song goes, we've only just begun. We've only just scratched the surface regarding the countless examples of divine design in nature. My evolutionary friends, folks, they can't just explain one or two examples. They have to explain them all. And they're not even close because there was a divine designer, wasn't there? As lights come back on, please, we hope and pray all of us here have trusted the divine designer, the creator, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anybody here with any doubts at all about that, please don't go until you talk to one of us. Make sure you know for a fact that you are born again, that you have eternal life, right? The Bible tells us that at some point, we have to confess our sins before the Lord, right? We have to uh, uh, repent of our sins before the Lord. We have to tell the Lord we want to live for him and ask him to make us different, to make us new creatures, and ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Most of us here probably, we've already done that, right? Excellent. Good. But as you know, Salvation might be a free gift of God, which it is, but after that, if we really love the Lord, we should want to work for him after that, right? And you've got a great church just like this one here in which to do just that, right? We thank you so much for coming. May God bless you. May God bless America. Have a great new year. And at this time, um, I'll be in the back, but we now have a message. For um, Okay, in a nutshell, ma'am, I guess we better make this our last question here because this is going to take a minute, okay? <laughs> Many fine people would disagree with me. I know some Christians who disagree with me, all right? Make a long story short, this research blew me away. I read 47 books on this subject, saw many films, read dozens of articles about it. It's a huge, huge subject. I had no idea how big it was. And it can get very, very complicated. So in our program, we try to distill it down and summarize it and be as polite as possible, okay? Uh, the bottom line is there is zero doubt in my mind after looking at all the evidence that climate change represents a naturally occurring cyclical event over which man has very little control. Indeed, two German PhDs wrote a massive book called The Neglected Sun. Now think about it, folks. What do you think will have more impact on our Earth? a wisp of carbon dioxide gas, which constitutes 0.04% of our atmosphere. 0.04%, folks. That's not very much. Or do you think the full electromagnetic fury of a hydrogen-powered uh, thermonuclear star, a G2 yellow star, namely our sun, which one do you think is going to have more of an impact on our Earth? It's a no-brainer, folks, when you start looking at all the evidence. And I share with you just a couple quick thoughts that most people don't hear about, okay? Uh, regarding our United States of America, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has been keeping track of the highest temperature in each of our 50 states every single year since 1880, okay? They 
will, they can tell you in each state what was your hottest temperature ever and how hot was it and where. In Washington State, it was in eastern Washington. And folks, we are told that a major element of climate change, of course, is global warming, right? Which means the hottest temperature ever in each of these states should be when? Last 10 or 20 years, right? Completely opposite of what you might think. Washington State's highest temperature ever was 118 degrees in eastern Washington in 1961. Indeed, folks, we've only had three states in the last 20 years with all-time all high temperatures. <laughs> three states, that's it. The 1930s saw 22 states with their highest temperatures ever, the 1930s. Do you know we drive 11 times more cars now than we did in the 1930s? And we have all these electrical power plants, right? Right? Many, many more than the 1930s. How come the 1930s were so hot? Obviously, folks, man has very little to do with this. We could go on and on. The second thing I want to share with you, because you keep hearing about the 97% believe in climate. This is completely erroneous, but let me share this aspect of it. There is what's called the Global Warming uh, Truth Project, okay? They invite any scientist with a master's degree or a doctorate, and almost all of them are, have doctorates, to vote on whether or not they believe in man or anthropogenic climate change. Do you know how many scientists and physicians and engineers with master's degrees or doctorates have signed off on the fact that they believe that climate change is a naturally occurring cyclical event over which man has no control or little control? 31,000. Whoa. We're told everybody agrees that man's responsible for climate change, and here are 31,000 experts that don't agree. <laughs> Ma'am, does that give you kind of a little hint of what I'm talking about? Or, okay, I, I like one more example. They don't teach in most schools in the last 2,000 years. Our climate change has been a little bit like a roller coaster, and all you can do, folks, is hang on, enjoy the ride. There was a Roman warm period for several hundred years, the temperatures were almost as warm as what they are today. How many cars were they driving during the Roman Empire, folks? How many power plants did they have? Why was it so warm? Obviously, it wasn't people's fault, was it? Then we had what was called the Dark Ages, and the temperatures plummeted. Why? How did that happen? People had nothing to do with it. It's mainly the sun and cosmic rays and what's called orbital perturbations in our solar system. Then, the medieval warm period. How many have heard about the medieval warm period? Oh, my goodness. They believe temperatures were as hot back then as they are today. It might have been hotter for 400 years. From about 900 AD to 1300 AD. Why was it so hot? Once again, folks, the Crusaders weren't driving any cars. There were no power plants. There were no factories. Nature, folks, was doing it. We had very little to do, with, to do with it. Then they had what was called the Little Ice Age. It got cold, 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 especially what's called the Maunder Minimum in the late 1600s for about 50 years. An art history expert told me there's an entire category of art from Europe from this time period depicting ice everywhere. <laughs> People ice skating, people having snowball fights. For 50 years, artists were painting pictures of the little ice age. Then starting in 1850, we have the contemporary warm period. How did that happen? In 1850, how many cars were we driving? None. How many electrical power plants did we have? None. Things started warming back up all by themselves. <laughs> okay, does, does that help, ma'am? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go on and on, Pastor. <laughs> um, oh, oh, it's 20 after. If there's anything else, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. We thank you so much for coming. May God bless you. And now, if there's nothing else, uh, shall I close in prayer, Pastor? Or? Okay, let's do that. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you so much for this church. We thank you for its testimony. We thank you for how it wants to share the gospel. We pray if there's anybody here who's not yet accepted Christ as Savior, that today would be that time. And for the rest of us who have accepted Christ, may we make you proud of us. 
may we this week represent you in this world. And we just thank you for all this in the name of our Lord and Savior and Creator, Jesus Christ. Amen.